You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 235. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Happy New Year, veggie lovers. It is January the 1st, 2023, and I have such an inspirational episode for you today. I was brought to tears. I felt so inspired. My heart was just bursting with love for Jane and all the things that she shares. So in this episode, I am speaking with Jane Thurnell Reed. She is an independent author and blogger, and she writes about health and well-being with a focus on positive lifestyle solutions. She's in her 70s and loves inspiring others. She enjoys lifting weights in the gym. In this episode, you will hear her latest deadlift PR, riding her bike and eating healthy with a dusting of vegan chocolate. Her books, 190 Weight Loss Hacks, What the Evidence Says, and Menopause Weight Loss, Live Well, Sleep Well, and Stop Hot Flashes and Lose Weight are full of evidence-based practical information. Her website is Jane Thurnell Reed. Thurnell is T H U R N E L L R E A D. And you can find her on Instagram at Thriving Jane. So, in this episode, we talk about her vegan story, how she really only went full vegan seven years ago in her mid 60s, how she discovered a whole food plant based diet and veganism how she's become passionate about longevity and healthy aging. We talk a lot about resistance training, how she ended up in the gym, her deadlift PR, and what her goals are as she ages. And we talk about the common perspective on aging and health as people grow older. We also talk about falling and falling prevention and uh, a few other really fun topics. But like I said, it's a very inspiring episode. I think this is the perfect episode to start the new year. So whether you're in your 20s or you're getting close to your 70s, I think that this is a great episode to listen to because when it comes to longevity, we have to play the long game. So we should be thinking about it early on as young as we can, because it's never too late to start thinking about longevity, but it's also, or it's never too early, but it's also never too late. So wherever you are in your journey, I think you can learn some really valuable tips, but also just be inspired about what's possible. Listening to somebody who is spreading so much joy and love and feeling productive and feeling happy about her life. So Happy New Year, veggie lovers. Thank you so much for being here with me another year on Veggie Doctor Radio. I appreciate you so much to all of my veteran listeners. Thank you for being here week after week. And to my new listeners, welcome. Come on in. Explore all the different episodes that we've recorded over the past five and a half years. So thank you so much for being here. I hope that you fall in love with Jane as much as I have. But without further ado, let us welcome Jane Thurnell Reed to Veggie Doctor Radio. Jane Thurnell Reed, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, such a pleasure to have you. And where are you right now in the world? I, I'm in the UK, in uh, very close to Exeter, in the southwest of England. Oh, fun. My family and I, we were in uh, the UK this summer, so we got to travel mm -hmm. around. It was lots of fun. I loved it and lots of great food, so yeah. we really enjoyed it. Well, I really am interested about hearing about your vegan story, how you discovered veganism and a whole food plant-based diet. So take it from the top. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually first became vegetarian when I was 12 years old. And I'd never met a vegetarian. I'd never heard the word. Um, but I'd, I'd managed to connect what I was eating with, with animals and decided I didn't want to do it. So I stopped eating meat, stopped eating fish. Um, my parents thought I was turning into a fussy eater. So refused to give me anything else in set, instead. So after six months, I actually got ill. And the doctor came to see me and the doctor said, my, mo my mother said, you know, she's not eating meat. And the doctor said, oh, of course she needs to eat meat to be healthy. Um, you know, this is quite a long time ago, obviously. Um, that's, we know that's not true. Um, and my mother never gave me anything to replace it. So I went back to eating meat. I became vegetarian in my 20s. I was vegetarian for mm, over 40 years. And I kept on thinking I should become vegan. I should, I should give up cheese and eggs and stuff. Um, and, and not quite doing it. Um, and then in 2015, I finally made the, the change. And so for the last seven years, I've been vegan. The plant-based bit, the whole food plant-based bit, I mean, in my 20s, though I was vegetarian, um, I was a vegetarian who drank whis a lot of whiskey, smoked 40 cigarettes a day, and ate a lot of toast and marmalade. So, you know, it was vegetarian, but it, w it was not a healthy diet. Um, That's and incredible. I think once... <laughs> <laughs> and then once I decided I wanted to have children, I began to sort of read and get interested in things. And I realized I really needed to, I needed to give up smoking. I needed to reduce my uh, whiskey intake and so on. So gradually I became more and more whole food. So whenever you were 12, it was more yeah. of an ethical thing, right? You were like, I don't want yeah. to eat animals. They're living creatures. But then you're basically forced back into eating meat. And obviously, as a kid, you probably didn't want to feel sick because you didn't have enough to eat. So that yeah. made sense to you. And then you said whenever you were vegetarian, you started thinking, well, maybe I should give up dairy and eggs. But what made you think that? Well, I'd be... I began very reluctantly to understand about the cruelty that's involved. For me, it's always been primarily ethical. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking, I, I began to understand about the cruelty that was involved. Um, but somehow, you know, I managed to put it in a little compartment and didn't look at that little compartment very often. Um, and I kept on thinking to myself, well, at least I'm vegetarian. Yeah. You know, at least I'm doing more than most people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, and you were, so you have to give yourself credit for that. At that time, yeah. once you were older and out on your own, were, did you have vegetarian friends? Were there other influences around you or was it still pretty rare? Oh, it was really rare, really rare. Um, I was considered to be very odd. The fact that I ate wholemeal bread was considered to be extremely strange. The fact that my small children weren't given regular ice creams and things like that, I was considered to be a very strict and unfair mother in, in lots of ways, you know, that my kids didn't get all this stuff that all the other kids got. Yeah, how, like how could you force them into that lifestyle yeah. of deprivation? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I think it's actually better now than it was. You know, I'm going back quite a lot of years. And um, I mean, I was told by a nutritionist that I would always struggle with my weight mm -hmm. if I didn't eat meat. Like you would be too yeah. lean? That that you would be too lean? No, what... no. That that I I would I would be too fat. Oh. 
Interesting. You know, <laughs> I, I, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, okay. She said, so, oh, you'll always be hungry and you'll always be wanting to eat things, but if you ate meat, you'd be satisfied. And then your weight would be, um, you'd have a normal weight. I was a little bit on the chubby side, not a lot, yeah, but just yeah. a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and that is still propagated in our culture, in the Westernized culture, that protein is the most satisfying thing. And it's very interesting because I've looked at some of the studies that show that, but then I look at my own body and my own self, and it's not true for me. Like, yeah. you know, like I could get tons of like, quote, you know, protein with the higher protein plant foods. And that's not what's making me feel satisfied. I get satisfied with the starches, like give me a big bowl of potatoes or brown rice. That's what helped me feel satisfied. It's not yeah. like, you know, a slab of tofu. That's not what I mean. I love tofu, but tofu alone is not satisfying to me. So it's quite interesting. We still propagate that myth. But if you look at Barbara Rolls and her research showing that that boiled potato was the number one satisfying food for satiety, it's a low protein food, you know? So yeah, yeah. it's very yeah. interesting. Okay. So do you mind sharing what your age is now? I'm, I'm 74. And so in 2015, when you finally decided, all right, I'm going to go full vegan, how old were you then? Um, so that's seven years ago. So I was 60, 67. Okay. So tell me about that because I feel that often we have this belief that once you've done things for a certain number of decades, that's it. You, you know, you can't learn something new. You're not going to be able to change somebody after a long time. So what is your perspective on that and making such a big change after 40 plus years of being vegetarian to veganism? I mean, it didn't feel like a big change to me. It felt like I was coming home, mm. um, you know, because um, I tried to behave ethically. And when I actually became vegan, you know, that that bit of the ethics that I kept separately, you know, about, well, I, at least I'm vegetarian, you know, and, and I don't want to actually look at what happens to, um, you know, how we get milk, what we do to chickens to uh, produce eggs and so on. You know, that I, that was all, all in a little compartment. Yeah. And, and once I became vegan, it was like, oh, I am... I'm whole in some way. Yeah. It just made sense to uh, you. It felt yeah. like the natural thing for you. So what yeah. was your diet before you went vegan? How much dairy and eggs were you eating? Was it like an every meal or was it pretty rough for you to make some of those changes? I mean, the most difficult thing for me, I think, was um, coffee um, because I didn't like soy milk in coffee and it often curdles. And um, that, that for me actually was the biggest struggle. And now, of course, it's so much easier. Now we've got oat milk and all these other milks which are designed to go into coffee and not curdle. So that, that, that was, a, was a big thing for me. I mean, for a long time I was like, well, if I go vegan, I'll have to have black coffee because I don't like it with soya milk. Um, so that was actually the toughest. And I didn't eat a huge amount of um, dairy. Um, but, you know, it's a bit like if you go on a diet, you know, um, you, you want the things that you can't have. Yeah. And I think also that was, I needed a mind shift. You know, people sometimes say to me now, like, what can't you have? And, and I say, you know, it's not what I can't have, it's what I choose not to have. Okay. And that's, you know, that for me was like a part of that. It's like, you know, I could still eat eggs if I wanted to. I can still go out and eat cheese if I wanted to. I choose not to. Um, yeah. yeah. And I feel like we're pretty lucky now in 2022 because mm. almost anything that you crave that's animal product based, you can make vegan now. And yeah. there are some replacements that are so close to the real thing that it's almost frightening. <laughs> like sometimes yes. I'm just like, wait yes. a second, check the label again. Are you sure that this isn't actually, <laughs> yes. you know, meat or egg or whatever? So yeah. it's funny how you, you mentioned the coffee thing. I am not a coffee drinker, but mm. 
I have realized recently, I've been listening to some other podcasts, people talking about some of their transitions from going with from coffee that has cream in it to going to black coffee and how difficult it was. So my husband did try all the different plant-based creamers and, you know, different types. Yeah. And he never liked any of them. So he ended up going just straight to black coffee. And now he's a black coffee drinker, but it was a struggle. And I, yes. I can't identify because I'm not a coffee drinker, but people, it sounds like people really get used to that creamer in their coffee. Yeah. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I yeah. think it's funny how it, it's such a small thing, right? But to you, it was that hang up like, oh, my coffee. <laughs> so I think we have to acknowledge that, that for some people, that's a big deal. But really, in the end, it's still a small thing. So yeah. for the people out there listening, if that's the one thing that's holding you back, just change everything else and then go with the coffee step by step, <laughs> you know, so don't let yeah, it Yeah, I would agree you. with that totally. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so super impressive, and I'm so glad that you were finally able to come to a place that aligned with your values and your ethics and, and you're feeling nice and aligned now. Tell me about your passion for healthy aging and longevity. When did that come about? I think that really came about, um, I guess, in my early 60s. And, and I was looking, you know, because you're starting to think about getting old when you're, when you're in your 60s. And looking at people, um, you know, 65, 70, 75 and older, and they were, on the whole, you know, spent a lot of time sitting down. If I met them, they wanted to talk about their ailments, their grandchildren, and maybe the state of the world, how bad it was compared with when they were young. And I, you know, and it's really, really boring. After about five minutes of this, it's really, really boring. And I was like, I don't want to be like this, you know. Because my heart would sink when I'd see these people, you know, I'd bump into them down the road. I'd think, oh, here we go again. Ailments, grandchildren. The world is in a dreadful place. And um, so that wasn't for me. Um, and the other sort of role model I saw around was very much the sort of Jane Fonda type. You know, in 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 incredibly glamorous, in full makeup. You imagine they go to bed in full makeup. Um very sort of toned, fashionable and all, you know, and, and almost trying to stay young. And that didn't feel like me either. So it was, a, um, it was a finding my way, my own way. And um, a, a, a dear friend of mine who was in her 30s said to me, Jane, you should come to the gym. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm, I was, did quite a lot of bike riding at the time. I said, no, no, I'm happy riding my bike. She said, no, no, come to the gym. And I went to the gym and, um, and I just loved it. Um, and that was a bit, that's been a really big piece for me because one of the things that's happened is that as I've got older, I've got fitter and stronger. And that's the opposite of most people would say, you know, as they get older, they get less fit, they get less strong, they get more ailments, they get less healthy, they get less, maybe less happy as well. But I've got fitter, stronger, healthier, happier as I've got older. Ugh, and, that sounds amazing. You know, so that's been amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. So how old were you when you started to do resistance training and lifting weights? Um, seriously, I was must have been about 66, 67. Wow, wow. Um, and so, that's incredible. You know, I'd done... I'd done Sorry, I was just going to say I'd done, I done. I did do some resistance training in my twenties, but I spent a lot. You know, in, I went to the gym, but I spent a lot of time talking to people, and only did the things I liked. <laughs> so if I didn't like a particular exercise, I wouldn't do it. So I did a bit then, which I enjoyed, but I don't think it did a lot for me. And then in my early sixties, I started going with this friend, and then when I was about sixty-five, sixty-six. I, be I actually became really curious about how strong I can become. Wow. Um, and, and I'm still really curious because I don't know, because I'm actually getting stronger. Um, so it's like, you know, 
Jane, Jane, how Jane you're I a beast. You're like, I don't know. I don't know what the <laughs> limit is because I'm just getting stronger and stronger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. So, that's so inspiring. And I just want to reemphasize that you said as I'm getting older, I'm getting fitter and stronger. And that is such an inspiration to so many people because just like you're saying before, a lot of us grow up with this expectation that as you get older, you can just expect a steady decline to the end, right? You're going yeah, to hurt. Yeah. You're going to start not being able to walk well. You know, you're, you're going to get weaker. Um, you're just going to be in the rocking chair on the front porch. And that's pretty much all you're going to be able to do. And you were seeing that side and you were like, no, I don't think I want to go there. But then you were seeing like the opposite extreme, right? The people that they're still tied to this, uh, this validation of looking young and trying to be young. And you're like, no, I want to go in the middle. I don't want to be in pain and just talking about my ailments, but I know that there's something I can do and I'm going to start here and I'm going to be curious. And I think curiosity is such a valuable characteristic and trait and habit to have because it does leave you open instead of that perfectionism of like, okay, I'm definitely going to make it to this, this uh, weight or whatever. I know that I'm going to go into the gym and I'm just going to test it out and see see where I go. And it's brought yeah. you some great rewards, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and when I meet people now, people say to me, how, how much are you deadlifting now? People want to know. You know <laughs> be, I mean, even people who don't go to the gym, you know, they, they, they're sort of, they're really interested in it. So, you know, they know when they meet me, I'm not going to talk about my grandkids, my ailments and how bad the world is. You're going to talk um, about your deadlift PR, sounds like. Yeah, uh, so what yeah. is, so I, I'm not going to be good at converting. Do y'all do them in kilos there? Yeah, but okay. I, but knowing that you're in the US, I actually did do a conversion okay, for you Okay, okay, spill it, spill it. What's your deadlift <laughs> PR, Jane? So it's 170 pounds. What? That's incredible. <laughs> Congrats. That's beautiful. <laughs> so so it's 77 and a half kilos. And my aim is all is to keep on lifting more than my age. So that my my one rep max, something I can do once, is to deadlift more than my age. Now, the, the thing about that, of course, is everybody goes, oh, that's going to get more difficult as you get older. So it's not getting easier as I get older, because when I'm 80, I need to be uh, deadlifting 82.5 kilos, even you know, more than my age. So, um, yeah. But you have a whole year to get there. So I think you can do it. (laughs) I think you can do it. (laughs) I believe in you. Oh, that is so (laughs) inspiring. Okay. Well, you kind of already answered the other question, but maybe if you want to talk a little bit more about just aging in general. No, you know, I know that you talked about seeing people and talking about their ailments or the opposite extreme. But do you feel that you're at the point now that you're embracing aging or is there still a part of you that's dreading it or resisting it? Tell me more about that. Okay. I mean, well, sometimes when I look at my body, you know, when I stand there with no clothes on, it's like this bit sagging and wrinkly and all the rest of it, you know. Um, And certainly I don't have the same level of energy as I had you know, 10 years ago. Um, and, um, you know, my passport, I mean, I've got a passport in my in my passport. My photograph is like, you know, six years old. And I look at it and think, oh, I look so much better then. <laughs> you know, I mean, because, uh, um, but so there is, you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not simple, simply, oh, I'm, I'm um, you know, in terms of how you look, you age, you know, you get wrinkled, your skin sacks, you know, um, your energy levels aren't quite what they were and so on. But in terms of how I function, I function better. Um, and that's always what I'm looking at, you know, how fast I I can run up the stairs. You know, we live in a three-story uh, three house and, you know, without thinking, I will run up and down the stairs. Um you know, and I don't think about it uh, because it's just normal. I can lift heavy shopping. Um, 
you know, I, I can do all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, the plant, I mean, though we've been talking about the exercise bit of it, the plant-based bit of it is really, really important because I think that helps um, certainly in terms, you know, I mean, plant-based food is um, really good for the immune system. It's really good for inflammation. It's anti, you know, a plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet is anti-inflammatory. And I think, you know, what we're seeing more and more is there's more and more evidence that inflammation is a really important part of what happens in aging. So if you're if you're eating a plant based whole food diet, then that is reducing the inflammation. So it has to have a really benef beneficial effect on aging. Yeah, definitely. Do you feel limited in any way by your age? Um, yeah, to some ex to some extent, but not as not as much as most people are by their age, I yeah. guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I do need I I do need to rest more than I used to. Um, you know, I need to, but but in general, you know, I do all sorts of all sorts of crazy things. I know because I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. just thinking of you in your 70s, deadlifting at the gym, and there's people in the 20 in their 20s that don't have energy to go to the gym. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's some people that you compare yourself that might be decades younger that feel like they have zero energy because of their lifestyles, right? So maybe it's not that much different as you think. So tell me about um, tell me about wisdom and experience what have you learned about getting older and what you've carried with you to your age um that, it, that it's a new time of possibility i think that's what i've really that's the thing i've learned mm -hmm. it's a really new time of possibility um you know people i mean people talk to me oh well you, you're obviously lucky you know, you've got, you must have good genes, all the rest of it. And and obviously there are some illnesses that are genetic, <clears throat> genetic based. But, you know, the, the evidence for most of the chronic diseases we're talking about, like di diabetes, heart disease, and so on, is that they're largely driven by lifestyle. Um, I mean, the UN on its website says 80% of the foremost, uh, of, of the most chronic diseases can be, um, can be prevented by four lifestyle changes. Um, you know, 80%. Mm -hmm. It is not, it is usual to get chronic diseases as yes. you get older. Yes. It should not be normal to do that. You know, I should not be the exception. When, when I go to my doctor or when I go to the dentist, they always say to me, any medication change? You know, as though I'm already taking something. And I always say, well, I'm not taking anything. And they are, they're always like, oh, <laughs> really surprised. <laughs> they don't get that response very often, believe me. <laughs> no, no. Well, I saw a figure in England that it's, and, and I guess it's probably the same in the States, that one in 13 people over 65 is not taking any medication whatsoever. Wow. One in 13. Yeah. Well, it's my scary. husband, he's an internal medicine doctor and he works exclusively in the hospital for hospitalized patients. So obviously these are the sickest of the patients, but it's not unusual to have a medication list of 20 plus, 20 plus meds. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, going from 20 to none, that's a big difference, <laughs> you know? So, yes. Yes. okay. So, you know, here you are, deadlifting, active, living your best life. But I want to point out to the listeners, too, that you're also an author and a writer, and you're very busy yes. with your mind. So how many books have you written? And do you feel that now as you're getting older, has that helped you with your writing? Are you still feeling passionate about that and spreading the good word about lifestyle? Tell me about that. Okay, I mean, I've written mm, ten books, I think. Wow. I actually don't know, don't know. A lot of them are currently out of print. They are very specific for a very specific type of therapist. But this year, I've written two books. Um, 
one I wrote in a month flat. <laughs> I, I don't really understand how you're talking about not having very much energy because <laughs> like literally that's very difficult to do. <laughs> so <laughs> I want the listener to put this into perspective. Jane is saying she has less energy, but she wrote a book in a month. Okay. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> okay, so so I've written these two books. I mean, the first one is a hundred. They're based. First of all, they're very much based on scientific medical knowledge. Um, I get really frustrated. I'm sure you do by these people who say, "Oh, I've just read that if I eat three squares of black, uh, dark chocolate every day, I lose six pounds a week or something." That, you know, that has or, never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. These these ridiculous ideas that that are promoted often by influencers and so on. Um, and um, so I wanted to write books based on on scientific evidence. So I wrote the first one is 190 weight loss hacks, which includes various. Uh, it looks at the research about what actually works in terms of losing weight, and then the second one is. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now, back to the episode. It's called Menopause Weight Loss. Um, live well, sleep well, stop hot flashes, and lose weight. And um, that was the one I wrote. I wrote 30, 34,000 words in a month. <laughs> I mean, it then took some time to sort of, you know, um, uh, checking all the typos, rearranging stuff, but the basic book was written in a month. Because I just feel, you know, I don't know how much time I've got. I hope I've got another 20, 25 years ahead of me, useful, productive years, but I don't know. So I'm like, you know, writing, writing. I'm now, I'm now writing two books on, um, on longevity and healthy aging. Um, the first ones are going to be, is a, I, I was only going to write one book, but I discovered I'm at 43,000 words, which is, and it's getting really big. So I've decided to turn it into two books. One is a general book on healthy aging. And then the other one is looking at arthritis, heart disease, kidneys, and so on and so on. And looking at the research about what helps, what works, um, and so on. Um, and then I also want to write a book about, um, getting children to eat healthily. Um, there's, there's a surprising amount of research on how to do that um, that people don't seem to know about. So, yeah. Yes, and we just kind of 
go based upon how our parents fed us and how their parents mm. fed them and mm. a lot of anxiety. So yeah, reach out to me when you're ready to read to write that book and I'll give you some of my my feedback on that too. Oh yeah, great. I will do that. Let's go back to the topic of weight loss because I yeah. do talk on my podcast a lot about body image and intuitive eating and health at every size. I'm interested about your perspective once you start getting to an older age and your perspective on body size and weight loss, do you think that it changes? And do you feel like there's women your age that are still trying different practices or crash diets, things that are not healthy for them to try to get down to a smaller body size? The reason I ask this is because I think that a lot of people assume that when you're young, you're going to be obsessed with your body and maybe do things that are more harmful than beneficial to just try to get a smaller body, but that somewhere along the way, as you get older and wiser, you just stop doing that. But I feel like that's not the case. So I'd love to hear from your perspective since you're already over on, you know, that side of things. What do you yeah. think about that? I mean, I, I, well, I think it, again, I think, people div uh, divide up into two camps basically there's the people who go well what can I expect I'm in my 60s I'm bound to get you know put on weight and stuff like that yeah. um, they don't recognize that their lifestyle has changed you know and so on there's some interesting research from the University of Sydney about uh, about the men um, women gaining weight at the menopause which they looked at people who had early menopause normal time menopause and a late menopause they all put weight on at the same time um, now, if it was down to the men, solely down to the menopause, they would have put weight on at different times. The early menopause women would have put weight on uh, soon earlier in their lives than the late menopause women. And and what they say is it's much more down to lifestyle and aging. And so, I think I think this can be quite a crucial time then at the menopause where women go. Oh, well, it's the menopause, so I'm bound to put on weight um, and then carry on from there. And they're either desperately yo-yo dieting and all the rest of it, um, or they just give up and say, oh, well, it's like this. Whereas if you recognize it's down to lifestyle and aging, then you you go to yourself, okay, I've put on three pounds. What, why have I put on three? Oh, yeah, I know why. We've started having wine every evening or, you know, um, I've stopped walking everywhere. I'm using the car more. You, you start to see what you're doing wrong and you can adjust it. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens at menopause and as people get older, you know, it becomes very much, well, you know, what can I expect at my age? I'm bound to put on weight. I'm bound to feel tired. I'm bound to have slow down. And if you feel all those things, you don't actually examine your own life and, 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 and look at what's what you need to change. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I'm not sure that's answered. No, yeah. that's a great point. And, I, and yes, I could see how that could be the case too, that you're either expecting that as you get older, you're going to gain weight get hypertension, get high cholesterol and just go with the flow yeah, yeah. or you start to get concerned and resist it and maybe go the opposite direction. And, you know, I know that there's still people in their 70s that have disordered eating. So that's yes. something to be aware of, too. I'm wondering about as you get older, do you see more people shift from focus on their weight to focus on their health? and trying to stay healthy and avoid medication or get off medication? Do you see that at all or not really? Not not really, no, no. I think people are either resigned to it or they do, you know, they're still in that trap of looking for solutions, looking for the quick fix. Specifically um, about their weight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess one way to bring people in though and, and this is what I've heard over and over again, is that you write the book about weight loss, right? <laughs> but in there, you're talking about really things that are going to help us have healthier bodies in general too, because that's still what brings people in, because that's still what they know, that's still what they want. Uh, but trying to flip that script of, 
focus on the things that help you feel better, give you that well-being and give you longevity is good for so many things, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a it's a tricky, tricky topic that I think that, you know, over time, hopefully we'll learn to navigate a little bit better. Tell me a little bit about falling. So one of the things mm. you're passionate about is talking about preventing falls or helping us get to a place that falls aren't going to end up being the end of our life, right? So once you get to a certain yeah. age as an older adult, a fall can end your life. It can increase your morbidity significantly or even yeah. lead to death. So talk a little bit about that. Okay. I mean, uh, the statistic is is truly awful that half the people over 65 in the UK, USA are afraid of falling. Wow. Um, which is a dreadful statistic. And of course, if you're afraid of falling, then you're less likely to be adventurous. You know, you, you're less likely to go to new places because, I, oh, I don't know what, you know, there may be stairs that are difficult. It may be uneven surfaces. I don't want to fall. And so people, you know, start to do less. Um, maybe they move into what I we call a bungalow. What do you call a single story apartment on one floor single like story we call them bungalows. Yeah. i don't know what... I, I think some people yeah. call them flats in some a places condo i too. think you might condo, call them a condo yeah. yeah yeah you know so because i don't want to have to keep going up up and down the stairs because i might fall and the irony is the more more you're afraid of for being afraid of falling almost doubles your chances of actually falling oh man <laughs> because what happens is, you know, you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, I need to hang on to somewhere. And you're all agitated and stressed. So you're more likely to fall. Mm -hmm. And as we know, as you said, you know, if you uh, older people who fall are more likely to break bones. They're more likely to end up in hospital, uh, be deeply incapacitated from it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the many, 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 many benefits of resistance training is that if you if you do resistance training first you're less likely to fall if you start to fall i'm i i'm forever stumbling because i'm always in too much hurry everywhere so i'm forever almost falling over but because i because i weight train one of the things that happens when you weight train you learn to be able to your your brain knows where your body is in space much more clearly so your brain knows very quickly that you're about to fall and will pull you upright again. And if you do fall, of course, you're less likely to break bones because um, weight train is very protective for osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. um, there was a big position paper in the UK this year um, from uh, osteoporosis charities, researchers, and so on and so on and so on about exercise and osteoporosis. And of course, they said to prevent osteoporosis, you need to exercise. But they also said, even if you have stress fractures from osteoporosis, you should still do strength training. Obviously not the same. It has to be modified, but you still need to do it. I love um, it. I love it. So what are your tips for people that are older and they're intimidated by strength training? Where can they start? Okay. I mean, going to, the, I, I love my gym. I have a, what I call, it's my gym family. When I go there, I just love it. But I recognize that a lot of people don't. Um, there's a really good website called HasFit, H-A-S-F-I-T, uh, Heart and Soul Fitness is short for, hasfit.com. And they have huge amounts of free videos and um, they have videos for people who are, uh, need to sit down to exercise. They've got videos if you have sciatic pain. Um, and they have all sorts of strength training. And most of them you can either use to start with in particular, you can just use, fill some water bottle, you know, water bottles or ca vegetable cans. So it's... and. The, t the husband and wife who do it are very, very unintimidating. They're not these amazing, you know, they feel like they could live next door to you and be, 
be really friendly people. So I'd, re I'd really recommend people look at House Fit. Yeah. yeah. And, and Go ahead. And the other thing I was going to say is, I mean, you know, do some aerobic stuff. Um, and, you know, the recommendation now is 150 minutes a week of medium intensity. And the I think it's the CDC who say medium for me, you know, if you're doing medium intensity exercise, if you can talk, but you can't sing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can sing, it's not medium intensity. <laughs> you need to dial it up a notch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to know that it's never too late. So my personal trainer, he calls himself a strength and conditioning coach, which I really believe he is that. He loves working with older adults. He works with people in their 80s and 90s, some that were unable to get up and walk on their own, that he's gotten to the point where they can yeah, get up and yeah. walk. And that can change a person's quality of life so dramatically. So it's never too late and start where you are start with what you can like i said start with the water bottles or the vegetable yeah. cans you know start where you are and then work up from there but i think the main point is to be regular and consistent as much as possible you don't have to do it every single day but two or three times a week just keep up the consistency be regular about it because what you were alluding to earlier about your body knowing where it is in space it's because you're building those neural networks. You're making those neural networks stronger by the repetition, you know, like yeah. your muscle fibers are connecting with your brain and telling you what you're doing over and over again. So there's a lot to be said about doing it consistently, starting from where you are and then just slowly adding as you go. So that's so inspiring. Thank you so much for that tip. Do you have any other longevity tips so definitely getting that resistance training in, getting that aerobic activity obviously eating a whole food plant-based diet as much as possible but what else would you put on your list of top tips for healthy aging and longevity i i, I do think a lot of people struggle with healthy eating mm -hmm. um and one of my fa my favorite trip a tip from my weight loss hacks book is a tip about the, called the variety effect. And this has implications both for losing weight and for eating healthily. And um, for example, a University of Swansea, which is in Wales, a re researchers from there got people to decorate a Christmas tree. And while they decorated a Christmas tree, they had a box of chocolates and they could eat as many chocolates as they wanted. I'd love to have been part of that study. For sure. <laughs> and, and one group, the chocolates were all the same. It was just a box of identical chocolates. And in the other, for the other group, the box of chocolates were a variety of chocolates. And what they found was that where the, where the chocolates were all the same, they ate less than where there was the variety. And the researchers say this actually works both ways. So if, for example, you feel you need to eat more fruit or more vegetables, um, then have a variety of different ones available. You know, so if you have, if, you're not, if, you, if you don't like, if normally you don't eat much vegetable, if you put small portions of three vegetables on your plate, then you're likely to eat more than if you just put one vegetable on your plate. So variety for things that are healthy for you. And if you're trying to cut down on the amount of cookies you eat or donuts you, you eat, then buy, buy 12 donuts that are identical. Don't buy, you know, 12 ones with different icing, different so on and things like that, because that way you're likely to eat fewer of them. And, you know, I know lots of mums and dads will struggle because they've got teenagers in the house and the teenagers want all this junk food. And then the parents can then find themselves ending up eating the junk food. So, again, what you can do is say to the, your child, OK, What's your favorite? I mean, I will buy you that one rather than buying a variety. The chances are the child will eat less and you also will eat less. So it's a real simple, healthy, healthy eating tip. 
I love it. And I love it how you can use it both directions, right? Yeah, you can use it like to help it. you decrease things that you want to eat less of, but also increase things that you want to eat more of. And that goes, you know, definitely makes sense as far as the human brain, because humans love novelty. So I, I, when yeah. you talked about the donuts, immediately I could picture because I love donuts, okay, literally. <laughs> I've talked about that so much on this show, but there's no vegan donuts in the town I live in, so that's probably good news. But when we go to Portland, <laughs> yes. there is this amazing vegan donut place called Dough Donuts. It's like my favorite donuts in the whole world. <laughs> and of course, when we go, because we don't go very often, we get like a dozen different donuts and then you want to taste all of them because they're all yeah, different, exactly. you know, and exactly. even though you're exactly. like full and not feeling good from all the sugar, you're like, but I still have to taste that one caramel crunch, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> so um, that novelty. But also there's another phenomenon that you probably talk about in your book called taste specific satiety, which once you've had a certain amount of one taste or type of food, you actually feel full. But all of yeah. a sudden, when you see a new thing, your brain's like, oh, I have more room. <laughs> yes. We all know yes. that phenomenon, right? Whenever yeah, you yeah. eat dinner and you're full and then somebody's like, you want dessert? And you're like, oh, actually, yeah, I can fit that in, you know? <laughs> so yeah. that taste specific yeah. satiety um, can be used to your favor if you're limiting your food options. But once you start putting too much variety in there, you're going to override that feeling of satiety to get that new flavor in. So it's yeah, very interesting, yeah. the human brain, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, I mean, we need to work with it rather than against it. You know, we need to find out what, how to work with it because, because at the end of the day, willpower, you know, it's, it's a tough gig, willpower. Yeah. We have to do it other ways. And I also want people to understand that we live in the real world and it's okay to have your treats and to have, you know, fun foods and play foods and things like that. How can we work it in, in a way that makes sense, that supports our well-being and longevity and our health instead of going one way or the other, right? Going, oh, I'm only going to eat all processed foods or I'm only going to hundred percent eat hundred yeah. percent whole, never have sugar ever again, sort of thing. So, you know, I think trying to make it sustainable is going to be best for most people. Okay, yeah. so that's great. I would love to know, what do you wish more people knew? I think that you can be healthier, happier, stronger, fitter, whatever your age, Ugh. whatever your age. I love it. And, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, and I wish I could sometimes bottle how I feel and give it to people and say, you know, if you eat well, not all the time, I have a, what I call a 95% diet you know so i do eat chocolate i do you know i do have sugary things and so on some of the time but if you have a good diet if you exercise regularly if you're curious about the world if you give back to you, to the community in some way all those things you know you can feel so so well i am like nearly to the point of tears because i want what you have at your age too. So to me, it's so inspiring to know that I don't have to be resigned to a life in the future where I'm feeling bad, I'm not productive and, and can't do the things I wanna do. So Jane, I'm so grateful for you. Of course, I've totally fallen in love with you. So I'm so glad that you, <laughs> you came to be a guest on the show, but I'm just so grateful for what you do and the energy that you're putting out into the world and the books that you're writing and just the example that you're being for everybody out there so that they know that they can also have what you have. Before we go, I want a couple more questions. So do yeah. you have a morning routine? If so, can you share it with us? I, I don't. I mean, I do, but not in the sense of, you know, how people get up and meditate and stuff like that. You know, I wake up, have coffee, um, look at the news, <laughs> you know, then I have breakfast, then I get dressed. You know, it's not, I don't have any sort of spiritual type stuff in the morning. It's very um, prosaic, my, my morning routine. Yeah. You're just, you got to get your coffee and you got to get ready to go. <laughs> got to start yes. writing those books. <laughs> yes. Get to the gym and do your deadlifts. So, yeah. Okay. 
where can listeners connect with you and tell us about what products and services you offer? Okay, so um, I've got a, I've got a blog which is janethernellreed.com. Um, I've got an Instagram account which is uh, at Thriving Jane, and it's interesting what you said about you know you want to be like me. When I first started um, putting stuff on Instagram, I w- I was really really nervous, but I've consistently had uh, people DMing me to say. You know, I'm in my 40s or something like that. And I look at my mom and she's, you know, full of aches and pains and all the rest of it. And I thought this was how it was going to be for me too. Now I've seen your Instagram videos. I realize I can do it differently. And so that's that's been absolutely fantastic. So that's at Thriving Jane. Um, and then I've got the two books that uh, one is 190 weight loss hacks, what the evidence says, and the other one is uh, on menopause weight loss, but it's bigger than that, it's on a lot more than that. And they're available as eBooks, paperbacks, and as audio books um, via Amazon and Audible and iTunes. Awesome, did you record the audio yourself? No, I didn't, no, no, it's, it's I think, it's it's one of those things that you think, oh yeah, I can do this, but it's actually quite difficult to do. So it's I very paid a difficult to do it. So it was my dream to record my own audio book, and halfway through, right. I was like, wow, I had no clue what I was getting myself into. It's really really hard. <laughs> so, but yeah. it's so cool that somebody else read your books too. I mean, I think that's amazing yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, last question before I let you go so you can okay. move on with your day. Leave us with your number one favorite tip for healthy eating. Oh, I've already given you that. <laughs> my, 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 um, uh, the variety effect one. Can I actually give you an exercise tip? Do it. Instead. Yes. So, because you know this thing about we should all be walking 10,000 steps a day. Mm-hmm. And people... People, older people in particular can go, oh, that's far too much. There's some research from the University of Sydney which showed if you walk 3,800 steps a day, and that's not a huge amount, 3,800 steps a day, it reduces your risk of dementia by 25%. Wow. That's so, a lot. You know, <laughs> it's a lot. And, I mean, there's, there's some surveys have shown that um, older people now worry more about getting dementia than they do about getting cancer and yeah, so on. Yeah. So, you know, I love this because it's so empowering. It's saying walk 3,800 steps a day. It's, that's not a huge amount. You know, I was recently at a dinner and I was talking to this older woman and, and I told her this and she went to me, I could do that. Yes. I can do yeah. that. I'm going to do that. You know, it's doable. Yes. Um, hopefully, you know, I said to her, well, stop. Start and do the 3,800 and then maybe you'll like it so much you'll want to do even more. Yeah, but, I, but I it's think a... that's such a great tip because we do sometimes, I think, give recommendations that feel so out of reach for people that they don't even try any at all. They feel like yeah. even if they could get part of the way, it's not going to give them the benefit that the full amount. So I think it's important. And I know some recent research has also come out that even five minutes of activity after a meal helps improve your insulin sensitivity and decrease your glucose yeah. spike so much, even five minutes. And, you know, I remember I told my husband that he was like, same reaction. He's like, oh, I could do that. You know, you can get yeah, up and yeah. walk around for five minutes or walk in place or march in place or whatever. And that's those little things that add up over time that really do decrease our risk of disease because now we know things like dementia, it's the same process as heart disease and hypertension yeah. and, and diabetes. It's this inflammatory process that's happening, probably insulin resistance that's also contributing to it. So that's why when we're starting to look at the research, we're like, oh, even a little bit has a big benefit for some people. Yeah, yeah. Jane, this has been so fabulous. I am, again, so grateful for what you're doing. So thank you for all the work that you do in the world. I appreciate you so much. And I hope that our paths will cross again. So definitely reach out to me if I can be of service to you in any way. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. (laughs) Thank you very much indeed. I've loved it. I love talking to you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. 
Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.